Tuskegee Airmen flew into history and strike how first American baseball umpire made the calls for change. All this plus CCN weather, tech bite and sports on CCN Crown City News. Your news, your neighborhood, Second Zoy. Mrs. Johnson, good to see you again. This is Mike. You can trust him. He looks just like you. I'll be sucking up to you in order to make you sign the loan. So, here are your low monthly payments and interest rate as we promised. Here's where they triple. The rest of this is really just here so that we get your house when you can't pay us back. Such a lovely house. Predatory lenders are never this easy to spot. Call us and protect yourself with the facts. Thank you for watching CCN Crown City News. Your news, your neighborhood. I'm Sunita Joshua Madison. We're going to change around our show to accommodate some technical issues, but we still have a great show for you. We'll start with a very special guest. Everyone knows Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in baseball as a player, but few know about the man who broke the barrier as an umpire. Emmett Ashford was the first African-American umpire in the major leagues. Emmett Ashford also was the first umpire to umpire for both the major and minor leagues. In honor of Black History Month, the Baseball Relinquiry and Pasadena Public Library have programs honoring Anna Emma Ashford. Today we're joined by Emma Ashford's daughter, Adrienne Ashford Bratton, who wants to make sure the next generation remembers her father's legacy. So thank you so much for being here, Ms. Ashford or Bratton? Bratton. Bratton. And thank oh. you for inviting me. Well, tell me a little bit about your father. What kinds of stories did your dad tell you about his days coming up in the league? How difficult was it for him? It was difficult, but I think he spared me the the heart-wrenching parts because I was a child. Uh -huh. And uh, he and my mother were divorced when he started to uh, gain more prominence, so I wasn't there. But as I was older, he told me about the hazings and the type of things that were yelled at him from, from the stands while he was behind the plate and that kind of thing. Um, but he still used a sense of humor in doing so. And I think that's probably what got him through. His sense of humor was somewhat of a defense mechanism, but he was always a carefree personality and someone who was charismatic. Okay, well, tell us a little bit about, you, you know, we, we mentioned that Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier for baseball, but um, how did that inspire your father to become an umpire? He heard it on the radio one night, mm -hmm. and then he decided, I can do that too. You know, he thought this was the impossible dream, but this made it possible. It's, so, it's amazing how stories like that can just make you feel like, well, if they can do it, why not me? Right. A door is open. Okay. And, and so what did he do? How did he make it happen? He worked hard. And, and what, what he did, I think, because you have a different situation than Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson was a player, but my father was someone who was giving directions. Absolutely. So he was, he was in a position in of authority. Yes, yeah. he was. And that was a harder thing to stomach. And so um, as he worked hard doing what he loved to do, he gathered supporters and admirers and people who a couple who backed him. So um, the word was put out. And then also grassroots wise with the uh, California Sentinel, I mean California Eagle and the LA Sentinel at that time, there were people who were getting support and, and having people write letters. And so the pressure was on. And again, there were people up high who, a couple of people who really thought it should happen. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because he had to do everything. Of, sometimes he couldn't stay in the same hotels a, as he needed to, or, or there would be white umpires who wouldn't want to work the field with him. Did he tell you any of those stories? Yes, and I think some of them are in print. Uh, well, the one he told me was the fact that because he was somewhat of a loner when he, they were out of town, he would go into various places. And I think one place, this bar he went into, it was, uh, he was talking to the guy, you know, he befriended people, and come to find out this guy's name was Jack Ruby. Well, when you consider the Kennedy assassination and Sirhan Sirhan, he didn't know who that was at the time, mm -hmm. but he was speaking to someone of importance there, and also... So he was speaking to the Jack Ruby. Right, because there was somebody who, who was nice to him and being a friend. But, wow, <laughs> so. that's quite a story right there. <laughs> that one, and then the, uh, someone asked me, why did your father like opera? How did he learn to like opera? Well, again, he told me he was, um, again, a loner, and he was staying somewhere, and his uh, co-workers would, wouldn't take, invite him out. Or, you know, and so he would go to the opera or things of that nature and just 
learn to enjoy things and learn new things. And, and so he was just one of those people with just his own style and personality. Tell us, I, I know that he had a, a style of umpiring that people either loved or hate. Tell us about that a little bit. Well, it was very dynamic. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the part that you hear the most about is the dancing. And that, um, that is a natural aspect. That he learned that in umpire school because he <laughs> and my mother met um, when Central Avenue was at its heyday and you had live bands and they were members of the Rug Cutters Club. Okay. So he was so naturally So he just animated. had that style about him. <laughs> well, now you've been trying really hard to get him into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, I understand his ashes are there currently, yes. correct? Why is it so hard to get you know his name into the Baseball Hall of Fame? I think um, it's a very closed operation there. <laughs> it's somewhat nebulous because, mm -hmm. uh, what was it, um, about 2008 or nine, the Chapman University Law, Depart Law School decided to, that they've put up the Facebook page and they decided to launch a campaign. And um, they found it very frustrating trying to find out when things would happen, what were the parameters, and um, it just, it was just, um, like I say, it seems like a closed operation. Okay, so it's And just the main argument was that even though he had spent his life umpiring, he had not spent the uh, required amount of time in the major leagues, oh, okay. even though he spent 15 years in the minors. Oh, boy. And the reason why he wasn't in the majors, we, uh, we know what that was. Absolutely. So I tried a couple of years ago to send an email. I, I read their page, and they had a pioneer category. I said, this is perfect. And at that time when I read the page, there were no time constraints. So we had another letter writing campaign right. and come to find out they revised the rules and there are time constraints okay, well, on the hope, pioneer. <laughs> hopefully there'll be another writing campaign and, and you know find a way to get him in there because you know future generations need to know about him. In fact, one of the ways you're doing that, you have an event at the Allendale Library coming up February 25th. Right. And um, you have a couple of books that you've written about your father that you'll be signing there? Right. Okay. And I have the adult one and the children's one. This is the one where I want to let the future generations know that there is a positive sports figure and also one who was prepared for his rise in fame. Okay. Um, I even have pictures of his composition book from school with the A's on them. Okay. And the fact that he had done community service, so he was ready to deal well, with all sorts of people. Let's get him in the Baseball Hall of Fame. <laughs> let's start it up right now. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank and you for we hope me. to have you back when he is in. Okay. So all right. Looking well, thank, forward to it. Thank you so much. We'll be right back with CCN meteorologist Curtis Peak with his full weather update. Join us when we come back. Thank you. Well, Punxsutawney Phil made his predictions last week. Who's that, you ask? Well, he's the groundhog who has the predicted the length of winter 126 times and is said to never be wrong. Well, we have our own weather predictor who is never wrong. We've got Pasadena Peak. <laughs> Curtis Peak, that is, and Curtis is here to let you know what he thinks of Phil's predictions. What well, do you think? I tell you what, I like that. I like Pasadena Peak. Well, you know what I think of his prediction? We will probably see on the East Coast, even out here, we will probably see six more weeks of uh, winter, but we are on storm watch right now here in Southern California. We do have a storm that's making its way down the coast. How much rain we're going to see out of this? That depends on the flow of the storm. If this storm takes more of a westerly flow, we are going to see less rain. An easterly flow, we are going to see more rain. On that westerly flow, any Anywhere from a quarter of an inch to three quarters of an inch on that easterly flow, anywhere from an inch to two inches of rain. As we take a look at our satellite radar right now, here is that storm that's approaching. Here's that cold front, the leading edge of that storm that's making its way on shore right now. Right here, we do have that counterclockwise clockwise rotation. That, that storm is going to come in later tonight into tomorrow morning. By 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, we should see, see rain 
and that's going to be off and on rain for the next 24 hours until Wednesday around noontime. After that, that storm is going to dissipate, move further east. We are going to begin to see clear skies. We are going to have a ridge of high pressure that's going to begin to build, but we are going to see some wind out of this storm also, a southerly flow wind. So we are on storm watch here in Southern California, so everyone prepare for that. And I'll be back a little later in the newscast with more weather for you. Back to you, Sunita. Well, thanks for that, Curtis. And now we're going to bring you a snapshot of some of the other stories right here in the San Gabriel Valley. Last week, we heard the shocking news of the longtime Miramonte Elementary teacher who was arrested for lewd acts against children. Reports say that Mark Burnt, a teacher with the school district for over 30 years, took pictures of students bound and gagged with cockroaches on their faces and eating cookies iced with bodily fluids. He is being held for $23 million bail, $1 million for each victim. Days later, police stunned the still reeling community when they arrested a second Miramonte teacher from his classroom for also performing lewd acts on children. 49-year-old Alhambra resident Martin Springer had been removed from the classroom the day before police arrested him on Friday for fondling two seven and eight-year-old girls in his classroom. LAUSD Superintendent John D.C. said the school board will vote to fire Springer at the board meeting this week. Parents are sickened by the news as well as the lack of information they have been given. Many have taken their students out of school. Some parents even protested at the school this morning demanding that the school shut down and the principal answer their questions. The school plans to meet with parents this Monday evening. In fact, I believe they're meeting right now and will close school Tuesday and Wednesday. Police arrested Pasadena resident Sonia Ertzian, age 37, Thursday afternoon for impersonating a police officer. Ertzian, in what looked like a police uniform, identified herself as a police officer to a group of firemen at the 1100 block of Linda Vista Avenue. The firefighters became suspic suspicious, that is, and called police regarding the suspicious woman who had no identifying badges or emblems associating her with any police department. Ertzian was known to have two outstanding warrants in Pasadena for similar offenses of impersonating a police officer and for resisting arrest in Glendale. Well, we're, we have Grant back and he is going to tell us all about the Apple Store that is expanding. What do you have for us, Grant? Good to have you back. Yeah, thanks. Good to be back, Sunita. Lots of news with Apple, especially right here in Pasadena, which is really cool. And um, we'll begin this week. Um, with some huge news from Facebook, but that news from Apple right here in Pasadena is the grand opening, or grand reopening rather, of their store right here in Pasadena. Now for months, the signature store and one of Apple's first retail stores located in the heart of Old Town on Colorado Boulevard has been closed for construction. During the recent renovations, the shop moved a few storefronts to the east on Colorado while the entire front of the old store was blacked out for nobody to see. However, this past Saturday at 10 a.m., Apple reopened the redesigned store to eager customers, giving the first 1,000 of them a commemorative Apple t-shirt. The opening comes just months after Apple rolled out sweeping changes to its retail stores, doing things such as introducing new iPads as pricing displays and more. The new store right here in Pasadena, however, is open at 54 West Colorado for all to see. And also this week, Facebook has been dominating the headlines with the announcement of their initial public offering to eager investors. On Wednesday, the company filed the necessary paperwork with the Securities and Exchange Commission um, with the intent to go public and raise nearly $5 billion. The IPO paperwork also crashed the SEC's website upon its submission as well. However, among the highlights of the paperwork were the fact that Facebook's mobile usage within the last few months has skyrocketed, the fact that the company now has over 850 million active worldwide users, and the fact that uh, game giant Zynga accounts for 12% of Facebook's revenue. Also interesting was the fact that Facebook uh, stores nearly 100 petabytes of data, or enough hard drives stacked up to equal the height of over five Chicago Sears Towers. Facebook is the world's largest social network and accounts for one out of every uh, five United States internet page views. And finally, Square, a relatively new startup which allows anyone to accept credit card payments on an iPhone or iPad on the go, is also making news this week. Now, Square already had a successful uh, year last year by getting their card readers sold in Apple, Target, and Best Buy stores nationwide, as well as adding over 1 million merchants to their service and raising over $100 million from various investors as well. However, this year, the company has already announced they'll be selling their card readers in UPS and Office Max stores around the country as well, and they'll also be offering new services to retailers to better help them manage their business. Either way, Square is certainly an exciting startup to watch, and we'll keep you updated on what they announce in 2012. 
And that's what's making news in the world of tech this week. Sunita, back to you. Now, that was a petabyte or? Petabyte. Petabyte. I mean, where are they making <laughs> One more up than these a terabyte. Words? Well, there you go. <laughs> I learned a new word today. Thank you, Grant. I always learn something new from you. Well, we will come back. We are going to be talking to one high school student who has become a best friend of a homeless shelter and helping them raise the additional funds they need to keep their doors open. You're watching CCN News, Crown City News, your news, your neighborhood. We'll be right back. having some warm days in Southern California, but the nights have gotten very cold. So we're going to take a quick peek at the weather from CCN meteorologist Curtis Peak. And Curtis, can we expect some rains this week as well? We can expect some rain. We're going to see some rain that's going to start to develop overnight, and we are going to have some cold nights because we do have a cold front that's the leading edge of this storm, and the storm should arrive tomorrow morning around 10 o'clock, and we are going to see uh, pop-up thunderstorms, and we are going to see rain over the next 24 hours starting tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. All right, let's take a look at our almanac right now. Today, our high was 71 degrees, our low 53 degrees. As you can see, we're about 3 degrees above average right now and 10 degrees above average for our low as I said a few minutes ago we do have rain on the way but look for all the skiers out there I know you must be clapping your hands and say yes finally our snow level is going to drop down to about 5,500 feet we should see around three to six inches but this is the good news also after this storm passes through we are going to have a warm and dry weekend Currently outside right now, our temperature is 63 degrees. Our winds are out of the south, southwest at 11 miles per hour, and our humidity is at 32%. When that humidity and that dew level get around the same percentage, that's when we know we are going to get rain. All right, our sunrise tomorrow morning is going to be at 646, and our sunset tomorrow afternoon at 528. Our lows for tonight, we are going to see 53 right here in Pasadena. And West Covina, we are going to check in at 48 degrees and 50 in Alhambra and Glendale, respectively. As our highs for tomorrow, 61 in Pasadena and 62 in Alhambra and Monterey Park. Glendale, you are going to come in at 60 degrees. Now we're going to take a look at this satellite radar right now. As I said, this is the leading edge of that storm, that cold front that's going to give us a chilly night tonight. But this right here, this counterclockwise rotation that's going to come in tomorrow morning around 10 o'clock. We are going to see that rain begin to fall. The rain is going to go into Wednesday morning, Wednesday around noontime. Then it's going to dissipate. It's going to give way to a large ridge of high pressure that is going to build. It's going to give us two days of clear skies, but then that ridge of high pressure is going to start to go away, and we are going to see another low, but we aren't going to get any, any rain out of that. As we take a look at our seven-day right here, I love doing the seven-day. Here we are right now. That Tuesday, we are going to see that rain. No, not much sun sunshine. Wednesday morning is going to begin to dissipate, go away. Thursday, look where we are Thursday. We are 80 degrees. That's that ridge of high pressure I was telling you about that's going to begin to build. 79 degrees on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. But Tomorrow night is going to be our chilliest night of the week, 49 degrees. Then temperatures are going to begin to rise again above average temperatures during the day and at night. So if all I can tell you is tomorrow, prepare for rain. Wednesday, the rain is going to begin to dissipate and it's going to give away to a ridge of high pressure that's going to give us 80 degrees by Thursday. All right, well, Curtis, thanks for that. We will prepare. I have my umbrella ready to go out tomorrow. All right. I'll have no excuses if you I get wet, right? I told you. Thank you, Curtis. <laughs> well, Kurt, as Curtis mentioned about the cold weather and the, uh, the rains coming in, it's especially hard for those who don't have a warm place to call home. Pasadena's bad weather shelter has been a friend to many homeless people looking to get out of the cold when the temps drop. But now the shelter is in need of friends of their own. Budget cuts have forced the city of Pasadena to eliminate its 
made $60,000 contribution to the shelter by the end of the year. CCN's Natalie Tavidian spoke with one high school student who has become a best friend of the shelter by helping to raise the additional funds needed to keep the doors open. Hi, Natalie. Hi, Sunita. So this teenage girl I spoke with, she's doing so much to replace the funds that the city is it's losing. Uh, the Bad Weather Shelter is one of the programs of the Ecumenical Council in the city of Pasadena area, Congregations, or EPAC. Um, the goal is to alleviate the effects of poverty. Rebecca Wong, a high school senior, is working hard to help fill the funding gap left by the city, which accounts for half of the shelter's budget. She wants her campaign called Friends of the Bad Weather Shelter to continue to provide funding to hundreds of homeless people in risk of weather-related illnesses and deaths. Executive Director of ECPAC, Pastor Pat O'Reilly, says Rebecca is an inspiration. Yeah, great. High school senior Rebecca Huang couldn't believe it when she heard that Pasadena's bad weather shelter would have to shut down due to budget cuts. However, she knew the information came from a credible source. Her father, Bill Huang, heads the housing department for the city of Pasadena. In a conversation with her dad, Rebecca found out that the shelter would stop operating when the city eliminates its funding. The conversation with her dad led Rebecca to launch the Friends of the Bad Weather campaign. Their first friend, Mayor Bill Bogard, committed to $600 a year. He was our first friend, so he um, pledged $600 for four years. So nice. that was exciting to have the mayor as the first friend. It's always good to have you know, support, and especially from the mayor of Pasadena, mm -hmm. then it would be a lot easier for other people to want to join. Since 1986, Pasadena's Bad Weather Shelter has helped feed and house thousands of homeless people. It's able to do this through funds from federal grants and private donations. However, it receives half of its budget through the city of Pasadena. 2012 is the last year they will receive these funds. And it costs $120,000 to run the shelter. So we are, we we really need this effort by Rebecca. Pastor O'Reilly says the number of homeless people coming to the bad weather shelter have skyrocketed. Two years ago, one to three families a night. Then um, last year it was three to six families a night. Now we're having 12 and 13 families a night. They are a high tolerance shelter accepting all homeless people from those with families to those with addictions or volatile people. Because of the nature of the center, the staff must be highly trained. Wong says her original idea to ask 100 businesses to commit to $600 a year didn't happen. But in only a few short months, the Friends of the Bad Weather campaign is going strong. We started um, around Thanksgiving time, so it's been a few months. And we've raised a little over 15000 so we're a quarter of the way to the goal. The campaign can be seen on posters throughout the city of Pasadena. Wong says she connected with the Arts Center to design the posters. I talked to them about my campaign and kind of what we wanted, what we were looking for with the poster. They had an alum, Patrick Ruby, and so he was the one who designed it, and he did a really great job on that. It's a very creative and clever idea. It has like a cloud and rain and then um, kind of like a tree umbrella, which is really clever because um, ECPAC's symbol is a tree. And then okay. the Bad Weather Shelter is kind of like an umbrella, you know, sheltering people. When it comes to homelessness, O'Reilly says the impact of the economy is clear. We've looked at the demographics this year. Uh, we've seen that about 25% of the people in the shelter this year so far um, have become homeless because of lost jobs. Uh, there's another 10 or 11 percent that, uh, in addition to that, that have become homeless because of lower income. Um, so we see the impact of the economy. Huang says she hopes to keep the fundraising efforts going for years to come, especially after seeing firsthand what the shelter provides. This past Monday, I went to volunteer at the Bad Weather Shelter, which was mm -hmm. an amazing experience. And then, you know, just kind of it's good to go and be reminded like, oh, this is what I'm doing all this fundraising for. Rebecca Wong says one company, Properties International, donated $5,000 and added another 3000 by selling Rose Parade tickets. She says she has made most of the efforts so far on her own, but hopes to get some other teenagers involved. Her next step is to meet with Pasadena Youth Council to spread the news on how to help when the shelter, uh, and on how to help. When the shelter first opened, six homeless people died from the cold. This was in 1980. Pat O'Reilly says to get a warm meal every night during the coldest time of the year makes the biggest difference in saving lives.
Well, that is just an amazing story that a high school student has taken it upon herself. It is. It I really mean, is. that's a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. So I am sure that she says she hopes to keep it going for a very, very long time. Well, what an inspiration! We need to have her in here to inspire us all. Thanks for that Absolutely. story, Natalie. Thanks. Now, EPEC also runs three other programs aside from the Bad Weather Shelter, along with the Women's Room and Homeless Prevention programs. The pantry provides food to low-income households and the homeless. For more information on EPEC, its programs, or how to get involved. Log on to EPAC, E-C-P-A-C dot com. Well, the Tuskegee Airmen honored in a blockbuster th in theater now and at the local post office. You won't want to miss this. All coming up next on CCN Crown City News. Your news, your neighborhood. <music> Last summer, Congressman Adam Schiff encouraged his colleagues to help pass legislation to designate the U.S. Postal Service Office at 281 East Colorado Boulevard in Pasadena, the first Lieutenant Oliver Goodall Post Office. Goodall was a former Tuskegee Airman and a national hero. Here's TK Trinidad with more. Thanks, Anita. Unlike superheroes in comic books, former Altadena resident Oliver Goodall was a real-life superhero. Along with flying with Tuskegee Airmen, Oliver Goodall was a postal worker and provided more than 50 years of service to the community as a public service worker. The story of the Tuskegee Airmen is unlike any other. Despite the fact the country, despite the fact the country they were born in treated them as less than as less than men, they still decided to fight for it. Last week, I attended a meeting for the Los Angeles chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen, an organization Goodwill helped establish and met with many who served with Oliver Goodwill. On a cool January day, the city of Pasadena renamed its post office after longtime Altadena resident, former postal worker, and Tuskegee Airman Oliver Goodall. The Tuskegee Airmen, who were the first African American aviators in the United States Armed Forces, helped to break down racial barriers and pave the way for racial integration of Army facilities in 1949. At the Tuskegee Airmen Los Angeles chapter, Tuskegee Airman Ted Lumpkin remembers Goodall. Oliver is a longtime resident of Altadena. And uh, thought very highly of uh, that area of, uh, of the county. He was a uh, very dedicated uh, uh, Tuskegee Airman. Goodall was one of the 60 African Americans arrested for trying to walk into an all white officers club. Goodall, Lumpkin, and other airmen not only fought for America in World War II, but also fought to end racial segregation. I was drafted and uh, was assigned to Tuskegee uh, in the uh, the Tuskegee Airmen received eight Purple Hearts, 14 Bronze Stars, 744 Air Medals, and the list goes on. But most importantly, they were the first African American military aviators. Well, I think it's uh, important to know that there was a Tuskegee Airmen and that they overcome obstacles. The courage of the airmen inspired even the likes of famed filmmaker George Lucas to spend his own money to bring their story to the big screen, as portrayed in the film Red Tails. The Tuskegee Airmen were part of an Army Air Corps program called the Tuskegee Experiment to train African Americans to fly and maintain combat aircrafts. Prior to 1940, African Americans were not allowed to be U.S. military pilots. They had one of the best records of not losing bombers and were in high demand for escort service by U.S. bomber crews. Lumpkin believes the reason for their success was... They were educated, they were motivated, and but we had an uh, excellent leader. Although Lucas struggled to bring the all-African-American cast Red Tails to the screen, it's been reported that, the, that he spent almost $60 million of his own money to make it. It managed to come in, come in second when it opened last month and had made more than $40 million so far. But it's not the first movie about the Airmen. The movie The Tuskegee Airmen first came out in 1995 and also had a successful run. Goodall, Lumpkin, and the other Tuskegee Airmen did a lot for the country despite all odds and should be remembered not just during Black History Month, but as a part of the fabric of American history. Well, thanks for that, TK. And you've, you've seen the movie. What do you think? I've seen both, and they're actually really good. And you should go and see it. And, and were they quite similar? Um, they were different, obviously, 1995, different effects and stuff like that. So they, they, they're they similar in certain histories, but in some aspects, they took different, different There's directions. There's no lightsabers in this one, though, No right? lightsabers, Okay, no. okay, well, thank you for that. Well, Lucas has said his main goal in making the movie was to get as many kids to see the film as possible, so it will continue to be shown in classrooms for years to come. He wants kids to come out of the movie 
will be talking about how cool the airmen were, which I'm sure they will, and while George Lucas knows a thing or two about having kids think his movies are cool. Well, we are going to go into uh, sports right now. We have Hire here to let us know who advanced to the next level in women's college basketball. Hire, what do you have for us? Well, um, women's college basketball, which doesn't get a lot of airtime, I guess I should say, but they did a really good job in um, the last meeting they had with El Camino. They didn't do so well, so they kind of redeemed themselves this time around. Yeah, well, let us know. Yeah. It was a South Coast Conference matchup between the PCC Lady Lancers and El Camino College last Wednesday. What was on the line? A playoff spot and an opportunity for the Lady Lancers to redeem themselves from the last meeting. Those present included the PCC Pep Band and Cheer Squad for full-on support. Here are the highlights. Tip-off captured by El Camino, who show complete control over the ball and execute with ease down the middle. El Camino's shooting game is strong. PCC trails by a few points in the first half, 19-16 El Camino. Game is tied as halftime approaches with 56 seconds left on the clock. Number 12, Adrena Rendon for a peanut butter smooth three. Camino brings offensive power to the court while PCC runs full throttle defense. It's a trip to the free money line for PCC. Lady Lancer number 10, Sabrina Martinez's shot is good despite the sloppy passing. They're trying to figure it out and she has it in her hands and there she goes. Mm -hmm. Another three which seems to be her specialty. Camino's number and then back to the, back to the line. PCC returns to the free throw line and executes. Camino takes the ball, but PCC fights back and quickly recovers. Basket is good. Lady Lancers secure a 10-point lead over the El Camino. 50-40 in the second half. Ultimately, PCC defeat El Camino with a final score of 78-66. PCC has a huge challenge ahead of them. The El Camino match was a great victory for the Lady Lancers. PCC is ranked fifth in the conference and must win the next four games to build a better overall record and advance for a solid playoff spot. Best wishes, Lady Lancers. Sunita, back to you. Peanut butter smooth. I really <laughs> love that. Thanks, Hyra, for that. Well, that's all for this newscast. Thanks to Adrian Ashford Bratton for joining us in studio. Thanks to all of our sponsors, including Southern California Edison, Wink Marketing, and the Pasadena Enterprise Center office building with available office space. Thanks also to the CCN crew. You just don't know how they make this show possible. But finally, we thank you for watching CCN Crown City News. Join us each week as we cover the news in Pasadena and the San Gabriel Valley. For all of us here at CCN, I'm Sunita Joshua-Madison. Have a great week.